What's cooking everyone? It's Monday, July 6th. Today is Charlie of the Westies' birthday, and this is the Pork Couples Food Guide Deep Dish Podcast, where we do a deep dive on all your favorite foods. I'm your host, Eric, also known as E, and next to me is my wonderful co-host as always, Meg, aka Megos. Hello. And together, we are a marginally less poor couple than usual, still nursing off of our Trump Bucks stimulus checks, because this here is America, and if you don't like it, you can get out. We hope you're hungry for some tasty knowledge facts, because today your main course will be hamburgers. All right, so yeah, America is 244 years old as of this weekend. And Charlie the dog is one year old as of today. Happy birthday, Happy Charlie. Happy birthday, Charlie. He's asleep right now. He can't hear us. He's awake. If you hear any grumpy dog noises, it's because he has to wait for his cake till we're done with this. But yeah, so the 4th of July was this past Saturday, and I hope you all had a happy, safe Independence Day. Hopefully no one got their fingers blown off by fireworks. And hopefully you all had some really good tasty barbecue. Let's start off with some appetizers. Uh, this week's Friday food, we're going to be having some tasty okonomiyaki. I was hoping you would say it since you actually know how to speak Japanese a bit. <laughs> okonomiyaki, if you're not aware, is like a kind of, it's like a savory cabbage pancake. It's hard to describe. I, I would say a cabbage pancake. Yeah, there's different variations of it, but okonomiyaki, like pancakes, they're probably the most like well-known ones they honestly they kind of sound gross when you describe them as a cabbage pancake but it's made with like a batter and it has a really tasty sauce that goes on top of it but i don't know maybe we'll get around to doing an episode about them but either way like if you've been to like any japanese street fairs you've probably seen them and they taste really really good yeah we had a good one at a street fair in new york city last year back when you could a go to new york city and b attend street fairs where food was served to people so like you know the before time someday we'll get to go back there and we could have some more tasty street food but until then we can try making it at home as mentioned this week is also our dog charlie's first birthday and we bought him some good boy treats at petco today luckily we had a coupon for what one pound of free doggy treats yeah one pound bag of treats from their like doggy treat bar which unfortunately wasn't like open to just pick what you wanted because a lot of buffet style things aren't like that but they still had the treats in like pre-measured bags so he was still able to get his free birthday treats and thanks he, petco he was a very good boy at the store too he didn't pee on anything or steal any treats <laughs> he earned it so he's had a good day today he's getting to just sleep on the couch all day normally i like to kick him off because he gets in the way but He's the birthday boy, so we'll let it slide today. All right, well, I guess we should move on to today's main course. (music) Hamburgers are an American icon. You love them, we love them. There's probably not a person alive who hasn't eaten a burger in their life. We throw around the word burger so frequently, though, that some people might kind of wonder what exactly constitutes a hamburger anyway. Traditionally, hamburgers are made of beef, but colloquially, we've all just sort of agreed that any cooked patty of meat or veggies or whatever grilled flat and served on a bun is is a burger. I mean, let's be real, though. Those things where it's like a big-ass mushroom grilled and tossed on a bun, that shouldn't count as a burger. That's a mushroom sandwich, guys. Fight me. Well, it makes sense. Americans eat over 50 billion burgers every year. 50 billion with a B. We even have a National Hamburger Day, which is May 28th, which makes sense. It's probably time to take place around Memorial Day. Hamburgers as we know them now, though, are they're actually pretty simple. So, you know, you might think you've been they've been around for a while, but believe it or not, hamburgers is like a pretty modern invention, like just a little over a century old. So, why don't we dig into the origins of this dish, because we've got a lot to cover. So you may have heard of the Hamburg Steak, which was named after Hamburg, Germany. But apparently people have been making these meat patties for almost as long as modern civilization has existed. It is a lot easier to eat an animal when it no longer resembles the cute creature it originally was. It's true. I remember my nephew James was, like, shocked when he discovered that 
chicken, the food, was the same as chicken, the animal. I'm surprised he didn't turn out to be a vegetarian after that. That must have stung even more considering your parents have chickens. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Anyway, the earliest predecessor to the hamburger dates back to the Roman Empire, believe it or not, in the 4th century. There's a collection of ancient recipes that included a beef patty called Isisha Omentata that was served as like a baked meat patty which beef is made with pine nuts, black and cream peppercorns, and white wine. I like that. I like that even in ancient times, Italians were still making basically everything using white wine. Like one of my biggest pet peeves with Italian food now is that it just more or less boils down to like, oh, it's a chicken patty and a white wine reduction. And this one, it's a chicken breast and a white wine reduction. And this one is pork brazole and a white wine reduction. So it's good to know they've been doing that for fucking forever, basically. Anyway, by the 12th centuries, The Mongols were creating early versions of steak tartare, and they just sort of like crumbled up horse meat and formed it into patties, and they kept it in their saddles as they rode around marauding the world. I hope the horses didn't know they were carrying around crumbled bits of their dead brethren, although I guess that would be motivating to keep working so they don't end up on the other side of the saddle. Yeah. As they conquered the world, they spread this dumb raw meat dish to a bunch of other countries, including Russia. During the medieval times, these ground minced meats were actually kind of uncommon because butchers were more focused on preserving the meat than, you know, making like weird new dishes out of it. Sausages in particular were really popular because it lasted for a long time. Ironically, though, at that time, ground meat became a luxury item because you couldn't really preserve it that well. However, all this changed in the 17th century. In the 1600s, Russian immigrants traveled in great numbers to European countries, such as Germany. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I didn't realize that Hamburg in Germany is a port town. I don't know why. I guess I, I think I just like envisioned that like every village in Germany is just like a quaint like mountain town or something. But yeah, Hamburg, it's actually it was like a sailor town. That's how it ended up with lots of like Russians and other immigrants in it. Now, obviously, as people travel to different countries, there's cultural diffusion. They bring their recipes and their foods. And in this case, those early versions of steak tartare made it over to Germany. And then over the next few centuries, these mincemeat steak patties became popular for some reason. Because, I don't know, it kind of sounds shitty to me, but whatever. At this point, they were still kind of like steak patties. And they weren't exactly Hamburg steaks yet. But then in the 1800s... German restaurants began mincing beef and mixing with onions and breadcrumbs to create these, like, sort of, like, meat bread patties that were more or less modern Hamburg steaks that we have today, but not quite the same. Things get kind of confusing here, though, because around the same time, there were restaurants in New York that were serving Hamburg steaks because they had an influx of German immigrants in the area. There was, like, some revolution or something going on in Germany at the time. I don't know. They they were fleeing the New World. We're not regular historians. We're just food historians for the purpose of this podcast. So if you want to look that up and fact check us, feel free to, but we're not going to listen. Bob, help us out. (laughs) You know, it almost seems kind of like a chicken tikka masala situation where Hamburg steak was, like, based on a different country's food, but it was named after that place, but it was made in a different place. I don't know. Like I said, it's really confusing. It's interesting to note at this point, from what I was able to research, it seems like the patties that they were making might have been raw. Like they were just like raw minced beef with like onions and breadcrumbs turned into like a patty. Pass. Anyway, in 1873, the Hamburg steak was officially named when supposedly Delmonica's restaurant in New York City listed it on their menu. And from this point in time, the Hamburg steak kind of spun off into two different directions. It turned into, one, the hamburger that we know and love today, but then also it eventually developed into the Salisbury steak, which is basically a cooked version of the Hamburg steak with brown gravy. This is probably for the best because that description of hamburger steaks is incredibly disgusting. Well, there we go. We established that Hamburg steaks are gross and that the Mongols may have had something in common with Grubhub. Well, except one of them is evil, manipulative, and ravaging cities and left no survivors in their wake. Which one is that? Um, let's just say they both suck. We'll leave it at that. 
because I think it's time to get nitty and time to get gritty, because it's time to take a look at the history and development of hamburgers. <music> Hamburg steaks grew more and more popular over the 19th century thanks to the Industrial Revolution going on and the invention of the meat grinder. By the end of the 1800s, ground meat was plentiful and Hamburg steaks were finally being made using regular old chopped meat. Over this period of time, Hamburg steaks were served all over the U.S. and were ready to make their transformation from a gross raw pile of chopped up steak trimmings and breadcrumbs into a tasty cooked hamburger patty, which also might have included some human fingers because we didn't have USDA regulations yet. <laughs> yeah, it's probably for the best that uh, you had the whole like meat packing like riots and stuff back then because... Uh... There, there were probably some legit hamburgers that had people meat in there. Mm -hmm. No thanks. The exact invention of the hamburger is tricky because there's not a ton of records that like factually list it. So much as there's just like a bunch of old family stories and urban legends that credit like 30 different people with the idea of sticking a burger patty between a bun. The one thing that historians can agree on is that the modern hamburger was probably invented between 1885 and 1904. But let's take a look at a few of the origin stories for hamburgers as we know them. So one of the earliest claims comes from Charlie Nagreen, who in 1885 sold a meatball between two slices of bread at the Seymour Fair. He made them so customers could eat them while walking, which you'll see is a common theme that we run into with a lot of these origin stories. Next up, we have Frank and Charles Menches, who claimed to have sold a ground beef sandwich at the Erie County Fair in 1885 in Hamburg, New York. During the fair, they apparently ran out of pork sausage for the sandwiches, so they had some beef lying around, and they gave that a shot. Next up, we have Fletcher Davis of Athens, Texas, who claims to invented the hamburger. According to oral histories, in the 1880s, he opened a lunch counter in Texas and served a quote-unquote burger of fried ground beef patties with mustard and Bermuda onion. Not sure what the fuck Bermuda onion is. <laughs> We're pulling a lot of this from Wikipedia because I could not be fucking bothered to translate all this into a digestible form. <laughs> As I said, there's a lot of origin stories here. Anyway, he had ground beef patties with mustard and onions between two slices of bread and a pickle on the side. Supposedly, in 1904, Davis and his wife ran a sandwich stand at the St. Louis World's Fair. I lean towards believing this story because... I've heard in the past that hamburgers were invented at one of the World's Fairs. Yeah, like I said, there's a lot of origin stories that mention World's Fairs, County Fairs, fucking all sorts of fairs. This next one is the family of Oscar Weber Bilby. He claims to have the first known hamburger on a bun that was served on the 4th of July in 1891 on Grandpa Oscar's farm. Supposedly... Uh, Governor Frank Keating proclaimed that that was the first true hamburger on a bun and was consumed in Tulsa, Oklahoma, calling Tulsa the real birthplace of the hamburger. I don't know about this one. It seems a little too American that the burger was invented on the 4th of July. Come on now. Yeah, I don't know about that one. That kind of just sounds like someone's writing fan fiction for America. Like, yeah, America, we got hamburgers. The hamburgers were invented on the 4th of July. And we were fireworks. They were American. We had shotguns, hot babes, or titties hanging out. Yeah. So I don't, uh, yeah, I don't think that's how it went down, guys. Weirdly, according to White Castle, the restaurant fast food chain White Castle, some German dude, Otto Kause, was the inventor of the hamburger. In 1891, supposedly he was creating a beef patty cooked with butter and topped with a fried egg. Another claim that we have dates the history of the modern hamburger to 1890 when Louis Lassen of New Haven, Connecticut, served the first burger at his New Haven luncheonette, Louis Lunch. Apparently, he ground up some beef, served it in the form of a sandwich to a customer who had to eat it on the run. So, like a couple of stories ago, common theme here was that people were trying to, like, find a food that they could serve to their customers as they were walking around, whether it was at cities or at the World's Fair or whatever fair they were at. But it makes sense. Hamburgers are really convenient, and it was a really good solution to just stick a greasy pile of meat in between two burger buns that would make it so you're not dribbling all over the place. Supposedly, Lewis's grandson, apparently he says that they have signed, dated, notarized affidavits saying that they served the first hamburger sandwiches in 1900. That one seems pretty 
like airtight too, but like I said, these are all really confusing, so I don't know who to believe. How would they know to have it like a notarized affidavit though? Like who is serving the first hamburger and like, hold on, let's get a notary. We gotta get this. Ah, uh, this seems authorized. like it's gonna be big. We know. This is really fucking tasty. It's gonna be the biggest thing. You just watch. Uh, so basically, the moral of the story here is nobody really knows who the fuck invented the hamburger. Nobody really knows when. We have a loose idea of the time period and a bunch of people claiming that their grandfather's grandfather invented it. Most of the origin stories, like we said, have this common theme of a street vendor that was looking to serve up these beef patties to customers who are walking around and needed a handy lunch food that they could eat on the go. Part of the problem is probably because hamburg steaks sort of hit a critical mass around the end of the 1800s, and sandwiches had been a thing for a while at that point, so it's hard to pinpoint an exact, like, first person to do it. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't really take a genius to fucking figure out, oh, what if we make a sandwich using this really popular meat dish? Like, uh, it's not rocket science. There wasn't Wikipedia at that point either. There wasn't, like, social media. You didn't have any way to really document it. There was no internet where you could just definitively stand up and be like, first, I did it, haha, I stuck it on a bun, it's mine now. So, theoretically, all these guys could have come up with the same idea around the same time and not even know about it. One thing is for sure, though, and that's that hamburgers were invented in the United States, and by for sure, I mean we're like 99% sure. There's that claim by White Castle about the German dude who made the sandwich for sailors, but it doesn't really seem to be backed up by anything. White Castle also inexplicably claims they invented the hamburger bun, so yeah, I don't know. I don't, I'm not really sure how you can claim to have invented fucking bread. Beyond that, though, there's some earlier claims that American restaurants had created before 1891, so I don't know. If we're going to be going based off of people making shit up, I'll pick the earliest claim, which is still in the United States. Honestly, if I had to pick one, I'd probably just go with the story of that guy Charlie Nagreen, who invented it in 1890 in Wisconsin. Honestly, though, I just like that one because he was nicknamed Hamburger Charlie, and that's adorable. The story of the Lesson family having notarized documents sounds like a definitive answer, too, if they actually have those documents. But at the same time, I kind of find it hard to believe that a hamburger chef was, like you said, able to just find someone to just draft official legal documents declaring he invented a sandwich. And as hard as I want to believe that that happened, it just seems so bizarre that lawyers and public notaries had nothing better to do than just rush over and declare this guy the inventor of a popular food that actually couldn't be patented. It should be noted, though, that supposedly the Library of Congress does recognize that guy as the inventor of the hamburger, so I guess maybe that makes the last, like, ten minutes of talking about this pointless. But look, long story short, the hamburger as we know was definitely invented around 1900, so about a century ago. Meanwhile, we do need to go back a few decades before that for one very important ingredient that all burgers need, ketchup. So ketchup has its own weird history that we'll save for another episode, but in case you're wondering, it kind of just used to be this like weird gross sauce made of like pickled fish and eggs and clams and all sorts of gross shit. Thank God Henry Hines came along and corrected one of history's biggest mistakes by inventing tomato ketchup. In 1869, Henry Hines of Hines Ketchup, as you know him, he invented modern tomato ketchup in Pennsylvania, and it quickly became a big hit in the United States food scene. Also, important factoid I discovered, apparently a lot of people in the United Kingdom call ketchup tomato sauce? What the fuck is that? What do they call real tomato sauce then? Like, they better not be putting ketchup on spaghetti. Who do they think they are, Japan? So, now that we've got a meat patty stuck inside of bread with some tomato ketchup on it, we basically got ourselves the standard hamburger that we know today. Over the next few decades, hamburgers started selling everywhere in America. Diners, restaurants, cars, and their uh, food carts, and, their, and all sorts of fair vendors, obviously. They helped propel them to become one of the most popular foods in American history. With the dawn of the 20th century, though, post-industrial revolution change uh, technologies made it possible for fast food as a concept to, like, plant its roots in the United States. At this point, meat was plentiful. Cooking food was really easy to do, and preserving food for extended periods of time became totally feasible for most kitchens. In addition to this, the economic instabilities that were brought on by World War I and the Great Depression made hamburgers a popular menu item. They were really cheap and really easy to produce, so they could be sold at affordable prices. I discovered while researching this episode, some places sold hamburgers for a nickel. 
Man, if we went back in time with the money we have now, we could eat so many hamburgers. If you went with a fucking 20 back then, you would come back with more hamburgers than you know what to do with. That makes me sad. I'm not going to think about that anymore. Anyway, in 1921, the very first fast food chain was opened by Walt Anderson and Billy Ingram. Together, they founded the aforementioned White Castle and potheads everywhere rejoiced. The chain actually began a few years earlier when Anderson opened a small burger stand in Wichita, Kansas. But like all other food chains, it grew popular enough to franchise out into many, many more locations. In the case of White Castle, the original inspiration for them was to provide a, like, a really clean, professional look for the burger joint. Since, you know, as mentioned, food handling hygiene was a big concern for Americans at the time. They had very lax regulations by health authorities. Burgers, like, even though they'd only been around for a couple decades, already took on this sort of grungy, lowbrow reputation due to their connection to the working class and cookery, uh, you know, places that favor convenience and quickness over quality and cleanliness. Hmm, sound familiar at all? Either way, White Castle wanted to fix all that. They made their stores come off as clean, friendly, a place that you could eat at where your burgers don't contain children's fingers. It ended up being a big hit, though, because they opened their second store just three years later in 1924, and with that, the fast food burger chain was born. Similarly, in 1940, Richard and Maurice McDonald opened, wait for it, Burger King. Close. <laughs> McDonald's. The first McDonald's was opened in San Bernardino, California in 1940. Weirdly, it actually featured a bunch of barbecue menu items back then, but the restaurant began focusing on burgers when they discovered it was their most popular menu item. Their restaurants were notable in that they helped propagate the concept of drive-in and drive through for dining. Much to the chagrin of doctors everywhere, you now could just drive straight up to a fast food restaurant and cram a sack of greasy burgers into your fat face without ever having to step foot out of your car or, or walk or just even perform even a menial amount of caloric expenditure. The popularity of McDonald's is actually closely tied to the popularity of car culture and road trips during the same time. The reason that a lot of fast food places have those giant like neon signs was so they could easily be seen from far away. And that would give people time to decide that they want some yummy hamburgers and, like, make the turn off the highway in time. Interestingly, Roy Kroc seems to be, like, the, I guess, like, the guy that everyone thinks of when they think about the origin of McDonald's. But he wasn't the founder. He, he just joined up with the McDonald's brothers early on after they opened a decent number of their stores. And, well, he was also, he was the one that helped them propel into, like, a big mega national franchise. So, now we've got the hamburger itself, we got a couple of fast food chains spreading them all over the place, slinging them out at drive throughs and hamburgers were now synonymously ingrained into American culture forever. What's left to talk about? Well, nothing really. Except for the motherfucking cheeseburger! Interestingly, just like the exact invention of the hamburger, cheeseburgers have a little bit of a disputed origin story as well. There's a, a few different people claiming to have created it. I don't want to go over all of them like we did with the hamburger originally, so let's just blow through these real quick. We got a guy in Pasadena, California, taking credit for it, saying that he invented it in 1924. We also have another menu from 1928 in Los Angeles that says that they had hamburgers with slices of cheese on them at the time. There is some guy, Louis Ballas, who is the owner of a Humpty Dumpty drive-in restaurant in Denver, Colorado, who made an attempt to create a cheeseburger with a registered trademark known as the Yellow Burger in 1935. I guess you're not allowed to have mozzarella or pepper jack or anything like that. What cheese is even yellow? I guess orange burger would have been confusing, though, since there's also the fruit. Yeah, although an orange burger sounds kind of refreshing. Hmm. Note to self, try to make some sort of a recipe where we can shoehorn orange into hamburgers. Right. There's also another one in California who claims to have come up with the idea in the 1930s. J.C. Reynolds, a restaurateur who says that he created the pimento cheeseburger. I've never had pimento cheese. Sounds kind of gross because it's like weird, like thick cheese whiz, I think. So, again, we're not really sure who invented the cheeseburger, and there's not really any way to find out since, again, it was just a case of a lot of people coming together with a really good idea all at the same time. Overall, though, it seems like the cheeseburger was probably born sometime around 1930, which was about three decades after the hamburger was invented. 
but 1930s, this which coincides with the rise of burger chains and restaurants that we mentioned before. And at this point, burgers just grew more and more popular as the, uh, the 20th century went on. Food technology got better and better, more Americans are driving, and fast food restaurants just got huge. The hamburger became an American icon. It became a staple food for us. Industry giants like McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's rose up, and they turned into billion-dollar companies. Despite this, you could still just get a good old-fashioned hamburger at virtually any diner, local restaurant, or hole in the wall around you. Whew. That was a long one. Who knew hamburgers had such a rich and mysterious history? Obviously, though, the story doesn't stop here, because now it's time to get modern and see what people have been doing with hamburgers in recent history. Traditionally, hamburgers were made of beef patties originally, but over time, the concept of a burger has come to describe, well, any type of, I don't know, any burger. Like, a patty made of minced up protein or whatever the fuck grilled stuff you're having and serving it on a bun. Personally, like, I stopped eating beef about 10 years ago for health and ethical reasons and other stuff, but, like, honestly, I'll be damned if I can't enjoy a nice, juicy fucking burger still. Fortunately, in modern day, there's a huge variety of alternatives to beef burgers. We got rice burgers, turkey burgers, bean burgers, veggie burgers, meatless burgers, chicken burgers, quinoa burgers, falafel burgers, bison burgers. The list goes on and on and on and on and on. Turkey burgers in particular are a favorite of both of ours because they taste a lot like beef, but they're healthier for you and they usually have a lot less fat and fewer calories. And ground turkey is actually pretty easy to find and it's pretty inexpensive compared to other alternative burgers. You're welcome, by the way. You hadn't eaten burgers since giving up beef before we started dating and I introduced you to turkey burgers. You probably hadn't had them because your mom just hates them for some random reason. I'll never understand that. She has a fucking vendetta against them. And she insists that she doesn't like them. But then as we just talked to her yesterday, she says, oh, I get the lean patties and they don't taste good. Don't get the lean patties then. They don't have fat in them, so they don't taste good. Interestingly, turkey burgers were invented in the 1930s. I thought that was interesting because they kind of tend to get lumped in with all these like, you know, modern vegetarian options a lot. Apparently, though, they've been featured on menus in California as early as 1938. California apparently had a big turkey industry at the time, and even back then, Californians were known for eating wacky hippie shit, so maybe that's why turkey burgers took on the reputation they have today. Another alternative burger is the veggie burger. Veggie burgers come in a bunch of different varieties, but generally they're usually made of beans, legumes, corn, grains, and starches. Apparently, there's been references to them in print going back to the 1960s, but then back then, a veggie burger could have also referred to a hamburger served with different vegetable slices on it, so that's not exactly concrete. The official recognized origin of veggie burgers, though, is from a British dude named Greg Sams in 1982. I actually was introduced to veggie burgers pretty early in my life because my father ate them a lot. Which is really ironic because he's like a super duper right wing conservative dude, but then there he was like eating the, like the you know the hippy dippy veggie burgers. Well, to be honest, like given a choice between a beef burger and a veggie veggie burger, though, I'd go for the veggie burger almost every time because even though most vegetarian versions of meat taste like dog shit, veggie burgers they work. I think the texture of burgers being crumbly and minced makes it so vegetables can imitate it better. I don't know. I do really like veggie burgers, so I I'll gladly take them over beef burger. This next one, if you're a fan of comeback stories, you're going to enjoy this one. Another burger you see pretty frequently now is great news considering the history of America is bison burgers. These are burgers made of buffalo or bison meat, which, if I had to guess, is pretty similar to cow meat because buffalo are essentially just giant awesome cows with afros. So, if you weren't aware, bison used to roam America in the millions, up until just a couple centuries ago. With the dawn of U.S. expansion and the whole Manifest Destiny thing, buffalo hunting became really friggin' popular. And by really friggin' popular, I mean we went from literally millions of buffalo living in North America to about 600. It's the American way. Thank God someone stood up and proposed we stop slaughtering these things wholesale. And around 1900, the United States began giving federal protection to buffalo herds. Over the last century, they slowly came back from the brink of extinction. And we also started bringing them, uh, breeding them in captivity as well. In present day, there's about 10,000 estimated in the wild and, you know, probably even more living in captivity. 
So today, you can find bison burgers in most supermarkets, which is pretty fucking inspirational considering they were just functionally extinct a century ago. Do you think we'd have dinosaurs back by now if we thought we could eat them? Or dodos, maybe? I wonder what a dodo burger would taste like. If it's going based on chicken burgers, then probably not very good. Speaking of chicken burgers, let's go over a few other random burger alternatives. Specifically, chicken burgers, which are made from, well, ground chicken meat. And usually they're they're paired with their they're ground with herbs, spices, cheese, and other flavorings. Frankly, these things fucking suck. Look, we're huge fans of chicken. 90% of our meals are chicken based. But chicken doesn't work for burgers. It's because it's too lean. Like I was complaining about before, my mother buys lean turkey meat to make turkey burgers and she talks about how bad it tastes. Part of what makes a burger taste like a burger is that gamey, meaty flavor it gets from its uh, its dietary co- fat content. Chicken meat just doesn't have much of a flavor. It doesn't have culinary fat because chickens are lean. So there's not much to give it a flavor. That's why you just pretty exclusively see chicken burgers laced up with like sage and, and mozzarella mixed into it. They know that they taste like nothing. So they put in things that do taste like something to make it palatable. I don't know, because of that, they add all these weird ingredients, and it doesn't really taste like a hamburger. Also, the texture kind of sucks. I don't know. Yeah, they're usually, like, dry and just, like, not good. Kind of rubbery. It's so weird because everything that's chicken is awesome, except chicken burgers. What a fucking disappointment. Another pretty popular one we're seeing now are quinoa burgers. Quinoa is funny because it kind of became, like, the cartoon mascot food for health nuts in the last decade, but also there was that in kale. Ironically, though, I've had quinoa burgers. They're not too bad. If you're wondering what quinoa is, if you've been living under a rock for a while, quinoa is basically just a type of grain that's similar to rice. Uh, It's a little chewier, though. To make a quinoa burger, you just kind of combine quinoa with eggs, breadcrumbs, and flavorings, and they're a little more crumbly than meat burgers and veggie burgers, but they're actually pretty good. Black bean burgers are another veggie-based burger. They're usually made of minced black beans and other flavors and vegetables. These are weird because they sound like they should work well, but the few times we've had them in restaurants, they were really mushy and hard to eat. So, I don't know. Either black bean burgers suck or the places we went just weren't good at cooking them. And then, last but certainly not least, there's, of course, steamed hams. Mm Mmm-mm. Who doesn't love steamed hams? They're an old Skinner family recipe. There's also the patty melt, the hamburger's messy, sexy sister. Patty melt is effectively what you get when you cross a burger with a grilled cheese sandwich. Basically, you just take a grilled burger patty, place it between two slices of bread with loads of cheese and onions, and you grill it till it's all toasty and melty and good. This offshoot of hamburger has been around since apparently the 1940s, so not too long ago. I wonder if they're related to tuna melts at all. You know, it's interesting because I never actually heard about these until recently when a friend of mine started his own company called Patty Melt Productions. I kind of want to try one now. I've never had one. Meanwhile, those of us with Midwest heritage have known about Patty Melts the whole time. Well, while hamburgers are peak America, they've also grown into an international food as well. Speaking of peak America, while researching, I discovered there's actually a restaurant in Las Vegas called The Heart Attack Grill. Where if you weigh over 350 pounds, you get to eat for free. For fuck's sake. They sell a burger called the Quadruple Bypass. Fuck everything. You can't hear me, but I'm shaking my head in a very sad manner. Anyway, despite bullshit like that, burgers are actually widely available all over the globe now, not just for fat Americans. So let's take a look at some international variations that range from fun to horrifying. In the Middle East and India, there's a lot of alternatives for, to beef for religious reasons. Like, uh, they don't eat cows, in case you don't know, because they're sacred for them. Yeah, over there, falafel burgers are pretty popular. If you don't know, falafel is basically just ground up chickpeas mixed with garlic and other stuff to make a weird green goo, but it tastes really good when it's fried. So, for falafel burgers, they're grilled as a patty and usually served with tzatziki or a white sauce, or possibly tahini. Yeah, we make those once in a while. They're really tasty. You can put them inside a pita pocket, or you can just put them on a regular hamburger bun. Either way, they're really tasty. Yeah. In a lot of Asian countries, they also have rice burgers, which are popular. Interestingly, though, unlike all the other ones we went over, rice burgers aren't necessarily burgers made of rice, but instead you take a regular burger patty and you serve it on a bun made of grilled compressed rice. 
I think these are popular with like the gluten free crowd since obviously they don't contain wheat bread. They're just made of rice. I'd like to try one because they used to serve them at Stony Brook when I went to college. Speaking of Asia, Japan has come up with its own slew of weird burgers themselves. A few years ago, McDonald's of Japan created the Sakura Burger, which has a pink bun and fresh spring-inspired vegetables on top of it. There's also a few chains there that release burgers with jet black hamburger buns that were infused with squid ink for, ha- uh, for Halloween and other special events. Burger King in Japan also created the Samurai Burger, which has a blood red bun, bright red cheese, and quote-unquote angry sauce. If that thing about the heart attack restaurant before was peak America, then I think this last sentence was peak Japan. Ah, Japan. What would we do without your zany antics? Actually, on the topic of Japan, they also did give us one of the coolest newer takes on the hamburger, the teriyaki burger. Basically, to make a teriyaki burger, you make up some teriyaki sauce, and you brush it onto the hamburger while it cooks, giving it this nice, sweet glaze on the outside. And when they cook, you also grill slices of pineapple and onions. You combine it all in together with a sweet, savory teriyaki patty that's served on the grilled pineapple slice and the caramelized onions on it. And Oh, those things are awesome. You should really give it a shot. I don't think any place around here sells them, but they're easy enough to make at home. And then there's just a whole lot of other wacky burgers for all over the world, and we can't really cover them all. So let's just talk about a few other special mentions. There's been a few Guinness records for the largest hamburgers ever made, but honestly, a lot of them are kind of hard to care about since they were just like big one-off creations just made for the sake of setting a record. Instead of one-off hamburgers, we're going to mention a few that are, you know, things you could actually order on a menu. Let's start off with the absolutely ridiculous burger of Mally's Sports Bar and Grill in Michigan. And no, that's, that's not a description. That's the actual title. The Absolutely Ridiculous Burger. Yeah, that's the name of it. You might have seen this on Man vs. Food in the early 2010s. It's over 300 pounds and it's about the size of an elementary school student. What I like about that burger, though, is like I said, it's an actual item you can order if you're insane or high enough. That said, you might want to bring your entire family with you, though, because from what I recall in that episode of Man vs. Food, he had like 30 people helping him and they couldn't finish it. Is that the one where, like, a Kiss cover band, some roller derby girls, and some other people helped him? Yeah, I, I don't know what that was all about. I think they were just like, get all the most Detroit, Michigan shit together and get them all into this one bar so we can make a Detroit as pot. I don't know. Also, as far as extravagant burgers go, there's the 777 burger, which is sold at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. It costs $777, and it consists of a Kobe beef patty arugula, lobster meat, foie gras, pancetta, and goat cheese. Instead of ketchup, it gets 100-year-old balsamic vinegar, and it's served with a bottle of Dom Perignon champagne. Honestly, that sounds disgusting. I will never understand spending so much money on something that is literally going to turn into shit. (laughs) Yeah, well, as stupid as insane as that last burger sounds, what if I told you it was the second most expensive burger in the world? What if I told you the most expensive was five times more expensive than that one. Yeah, there's the Floor Burger, served at Restaurant Floor, also in Las Vegas. By the way, what the hell is with all these stupid, ridiculous burgers being sold in Las Vegas? Because that's where people have the potential to make a lot of money at once, and also make a lot of bad decisions. Good point. I guess they're banking on drunk idiots being like, I hit the jackpot, I got $10,000. Oh, let me spend it all on hamburgers that suck. Anyway, the Floor Burger costs $5,000. for a hamburger. It's a Wagyu beef patty smothered in foie gras and covered in truffle slices. It comes with a bottle of some shitty old wine, which is actually where most of the cost comes from. And that's like, honestly, it's a cop-out. Like, a lot of these stupid, like, expensive burgers you read about, the burger itself is just burger with, like, foie gras or i don't know truffles and like other expensive ingredients that don't even really add up to that you know that much money but instead they then pair it with some stupid old wine or some stupid old champagne and they say oh yeah the burger only costs like a hundred dollars but then you have a five thousand dollar bottle of drink and then they put that on the side and you have to get it with it i don't know i i just think the whole thing is really stupid Especially because this last burger is probably the most interesting one. It's served at Hard Rock Cafe. They have the 24 Carat Leaf Burger, which is basically just their signature burger, but they coat it in 24 Carat Gold Leaf. 
in layman terms, it's just edible golden foil. Ironically, despite this thing being covered in literal gold, it only costs $25. That's not even that much more than burgers in town cost. Yeah, exactly. Go figure. You could make a really nice burger and you don't have to pair it up with fucking 3,000-year-old wine to jack the cost up to a million dollars. Whatever. Let's just talk about, for our final topic, let's talk about one of the most recent big food trends in the last few years, and especially relating to hamburgers, meatless meats. So we already discussed veggie burgers, and while, like I said, they're pretty good, they don't exactly emulate the experience of a real hamburger. They taste a little different, they feel a little different, but that's where these new meatless meats come in. There's been two major companies pioneering these products. There's Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods. Both of them, they have similar products that basically construct hamburgers out of plant protein materials and replicate it at a molecular level. Like... This is some, like, super-duper scientific shit, so I don't really want to go really in-depth on it. But basically, the biggest problem with veggie burgers and anything vegetable-based that you run into is you can't get vegetable products to behave like actual meat does. Real meat bleeds, and it has certain flavors and textures that exist because of the composition of animal tissue. So, basically, these food chemists, they isolated this compound in soy and other legumes and... They found a compound that it's similar to hemoglobin, which is found in human blood, but they invented a way to produce it, and they brew it with yeast, and they called it leghemoglobin? It's leghemoglobin, I think. It's named after legumes and hemoglobins, whatever. Basically, they, they just put together, like, plant blood almost. And it's not some weird Frankenstein shit. They just extracted some sort of protein out of legumes, and they turned it into a meat-like substance that looks, feels, and tastes like actual honest-to-God meat. Weirdly, though, there's been a lot of scrutiny for these meatless beets after they debuted. I don't know. I think it's just a lot of old people think they're made of low-quality ingredients or something. I looked it up the other day when we had some. It's mostly just, like, starches and the aforementioned lake hemoglobin flavors, like beet juice for color to make it look like it's actually bleeding, like... I think the thing that scares most people off is that it contains a compound called methyl cellulose, which is just a type of plant starch. It's it's a non-digestible starch that just goes through your system, but it's not dangerous. Like it's it basically be the equivalent of eating like tree bark. And I don't know. Over the last five years, though, we've been introduced to these things. They're in supermarkets, they're in restaurants, and they serve them alongside regular beef hamburgers. Honestly, I like them. Like, most notably, like, the Impossible Whopper released nationally last year in 2019 to, like, pretty good success. And for the first time since I was fucking nine years old, I actually went to Burger King and I got one. And it was really good. So, I don't know why people are so up in arms about this. I think they're cool. Yeah, I don't know. I think the only thing your mom hates more than turkey burgers might be Impossible Meat Burgers, despite never even actually having one. I feel like she's physically incapable of referring to an Impossible Whopper or an Impossible Burger without adding, or whatever that shit is, (laughs) to the end of the sentence. Yeah. I don't know. I think part of it is that some people immediately think because it's not meat, it's a healthy alternative to burgers. So people will be like, yeah, but like, they're not good for you. But it's like, yeah, like it's weird vegetable hemoglobin or whatever. But so like, they have to like add a lot of salt to like make up for the flavor of it being all just plants. So like, yeah, they're maybe not the best for you. But if you're eating a burger to be healthy, you're eating a burger for the wrong reason. No one eats a burger for healthy. They eat it for deliciousness. Yeah, if you go into eating any type of hamburger saying, this is going to be a health food, I don't think you should be eating that hamburger, period. Except maybe for like falafel burgers and veggie burgers. They're probably pretty good for you. But like, not one that's advertising itself based on the premise of, look, it looks and tastes and feels like real meat. Also, as far as I know, I don't think any of the Impossible Burgers and, like, Beyond Meats have ever advertised themselves as being a health food. I think they just sort of be like, hey... This is a meat alternative. Yeah, hey, this is, it looks like meat, it tastes like meat, but it's not meat. Buy it. Like, I don't know. And plus, not to mention, like, if you already eat beef, they're not really aimed towards you. They're aimed at people who are vegetarians or who don't eat beef that want to eat a hamburger that still tastes like beef. So... Uh, I don't know. I I could go on and on about this. Uh, I don't, I don't want to just turn into like a, an Impossible Meat fanboy, but like I don't get the hatred for it. 
All right, so normally this is the point where we would give you a recipe for this episode's main course, but uh, it's it's hamburgers. I don't know what else to say. Everybody knows how to make a hamburger. Or if you don't know how to make a hamburger, you might have a head injury. Or be like four. Yeah, uh, I guess what we could do is just go through some tips for cooking hamburgers, maybe? Uh, overall, you don't really need to season hamburgers that much. I know some people do it, but let's be real. Unless you're cooking a stupid chicken burger, most meats that you use for hamburgers don't need additional flavor, especially if you're cooking it over like an open flame or charcoal grill or a campfire. Yeah, everything tastes better cooked over a campfire. As far as the order goes for constructing a burger, we actually spent a lot of time researching this and we couldn't find a conclusive answer. And I mean just just an excessive cartoonish amount of time researching hamburger construction. I, I guess it just seems like something that's mostly up to the individual, but the closest we could come to for a specific order is as follows. Bottom bun, that's that's an easy one. You start with the bottom bun first. That's That should be a given. Oh, I was doing the top bun on the bottom. <sighs> See, nice, well, it's too late now. Well, if it's the bottom bun or the top bun, put some mayonnaise on it because mayonnaise is a water repellent. I never really liked mayonnaise, but I will put it on hamburgers. It, it prevents all the juice from the patty and vegetables seeping into that bun, which makes it soggy. Like, seriously, that's one of my biggest pet peeves at barbecues that we go to is people will take a, a freshly grilled hamburger straight off of the grill and just stick it on a bun and they let it sit there. And the buns turn into fucking mush almost instantly because you have this hot meat that's just expelling all of its juices into bread, which is an edible sponge. Uh, honestly, you might as well be sticking the hamburger on top of a fucking mound of wet tissues at that point. Don't do it. Put them on a plate first like a human being. Anyway, next up comes the hamburger patty. That's another obvious step. But then after this is where things get kind of dicey. Most places will place the cheese directly onto the patty and they'll let it melt while it cooks. But then some people serve the cheese on top of the vegetables, and those people are fucking morons. I never understood this one. I guess if you want the cheese to, like, stay cold and prevent it from melting, I don't know, that's like asking someone for a massage, and after they finish, you ask them to kick you in the balls as well. Why would you ask for a cheeseburger that's not a nice, melty, gooey cheeseburger? I don't know, the only thing that you could do worse than that is using Kraft Singles as the cheese for your cheeseburger. Stop using this shit. Kraft Singles are garbage. There's six billion other cheeses known to mankind, which are way better. And honestly, if you like American cheese, I get it. I crave it once in a while. But if you really need to, go to the deli and get some nice quality deli American cheese. Kraft Singles are basically just sheets of plastic with yellow paint mixed into them. If you're still using them instead of literally any other cheese square in 2020, may God have mercy on your soul. All right, all right, all right, all right. I've, I've ranted enough this episode. Burgers should be a happy topic. They should be a happy place. So let's go back to the burger order. After you place your cheese onto the patty, hopefully melted cheese, you have several options from here. Here, you could add your tomato slices, or you could place the ketchup right onto the cheese. Personally, I like to put tomatoes onto the cheese since I feel like the ketchup directly on the cheese gets kind of slippery. Alternately, if you're adding in additional protein like bacon or eggs or other things, you're better off putting it here so that you can keep all the greasy, meaty parts consolidated into one layer. Also, if you're going to be adding in lettuce or cabbage or other leafy greens, they should probably go last because they tend to wilt and they fall apart pretty easy if they're mashed into the middle of everything and exposed to the hot meat. Before that, though, as all SpongeBob fans may know, you can't forget the pickles. Pickles, in my opinion, should be going right on top of the ketchup and the tomatoes since, well, the sour flavor of the pickles complements the sour flavor of the ketchup pretty well. Ooh, another pro tip, potato chips. Stick them in there somewhere. I don't care. They're just, they add a really nice crunch and just, because why the fuck not? Potato chips are great. So, all right, from top to bottom, we've got bottom bun, mayo, protein patty, tomato, ketchup, pickles, leafy greens, and then top bun again. Ugh, that was way too complicated for a fucking hamburger. But if you follow these instructions, you will construct the perfect cartoon hamburger of your dreams with no problems. Well, that about covers it for today's main course. I am stuffed, because this episode was a motherfucker when it came to researching the history. I hope you guys saved room, as always, for some dessert.
All right, so let's have some dessert here. We're going to try a, a, a little bit of a game here. Not quite a game, just this is going to be one of our recurring columns that we're just going to call shitty old recipes. So if you've never seen some of these old recipe books before, they kind of suck. A lot of them have titled recipes that don't really match the ingredients or the ingredients don't really make sense in the context of the recipe. So what we're going to do is we're going to take an old recipe book and we'll look at the title, and then we're going to guess what the ingredients were, and we'll just take it from there and see what kind of horrors we unfold. So for this week, and probably other weeks, because this thing is a treasure trove, uh, we're going to be using the old cookery, which I believe is like a community cookbook that was put together to celebrate the Bicentennial, which is appropriate because we were just talking about America's birthday earlier at the top of this episode. God bless America. I love this country. So yeah, this thing is really old and beat up, and clearly it was like hand-typed on like a typewriter and shit, so... I'm not quite sure where my mother got it from. It looks like it's older than every person I've ever met. Oh, here. It says this... Uh, it was compiled in 1911... By the Ladies' Aid of the Methodist Church, Austin, Pennsylvania. Or maybe just some of the recipes were. Either way, some of these recipes are old. Holy shit, yeah. <laughs> that means some of these recipes were over a century old at this point. No wonder they suck. Alright, I think I found one. Alright, sounds like a winner. Let's um, get started. Do you want to hear the ingredients and guess what the recipe is called? Or hear the recipe and try to guess the ingredients? I want to hear the recipe, and I will guess the ingredients. All right, you ready? Let's go. Grandma's mashed potato candy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that uh, that was a curveball. <laughs> Wasn't expecting that one. It was worth the wait. Um. Hmm. All right. Well. All right. Well, they're mashed potato candy, so I'm gonna guess at least the first ingredient is potatoes. Yes. Okay, we're off to a good start. Um, all right, well, what good mashed potatoes will be complete without sour cream? Nope. All right, how about milk? Uh, no. All right. Uh-huh. Well, all right. What so do you always put on your mashed potatoes? Butter? Yes, there is butter. Okay, well, all right, well, then, all right, we got potatoes, we got butter, so... Sounds like candy to me. Yeah, sounds like candy to me. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's get serious. Um, it, it, Does milk ever appear in this recipe? No. Oh, all right then. I don't know if these are mashed potatoes. Um, okay. Uh, well, how about... It, it, it's candy, so it has to have sugar in it, right? Yes, it has two pounds pulverized sugar. Two pounds of sugar? I'm assuming that's what the pound sign means. I'm assuming it's not two hashtags pulverized sugar. <laughs> All right, I don't know what I was expecting, but I guess I should have ex- it's 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 sweet pot- or it's mashed potato candy. So okay, all right, two pounds of of sugar. Okay, all, all, all right, I, all right. So we got potatoes, we got butter, and we have two motherfucking pounds of sugar. Uh, all right. Well, how about some? Uh, is there salt in here anywhere? Please, there's salt. Please. Um. No. Oh my god. <laughs> okay. All right. So there's no salt to be found. We got some nice, some, some nice hot, sweet, buttery fucking potatoes covered in mounds of sugar. Uh, uh. I'm gonna. Th- all right. Uh. I I don't know what to fuck to guess anymore. Carrots. Are there carrots in here for some reason? There are no other vegetables, but there is a fruit. <sighs> Let's, uh, uh, cherries. No. I might have misled with fruit. I don't know if this is technically a fruit, but you think of it as it's kind of in the fruit section. How about figs? No. Blueberries? No. Apples? No. Oranges? No. Is it more sugar? Maybe? Is it honey? No. Uh, all right, I give up. Uh, what's this, what's this mystery fruit? Uh, shredded coconut. What the fuck? Why is there shredded coconut and fucking mashed potatoes? Oh my god, I can't deal with this. How many how many ingredients are left? Uh, you're missing one more ingredient. There, oh my god, it's literally just fucking potatoes, sugar, butter, but coconuts, and... 
Flour? No. What? Uh, <laughs> vanilla extract. Oh, there is vanilla. I thought you said vanilla already. There is vanilla. Oh, thank so God. There's a- Okay, it's all good now. It's fine. It's mashed potatoes with coconut f- and, and, and two pounds of sugar. But the vanilla, that makes it all okay. But then there is one more ingredient. Oh, then. my God. I... <sighs> it, think of it as the gravy. <laughs> but not actually gravy. <laughs> I am going to guess... Cream? Whipped cream? No. I give up. Uh, four squares melted sweet chocolate. <laughs> Oh no! No! They didn't! <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Jesus! <laughs> Here's your recipe, folks! Two medium sized potatoes, four tablespoons of butter, a half of a pound of shredded coconut, two teaspoons of vanilla, two pounds of sugar, and four squares of melted sweet chocolate. <laughs> I'm assuming God. that's milk chocolate. I hope so. You just boil the potatoes, then you mash them, you add the butter, the coconut, coconut. the vanilla, the sugar. <sighs> you beat it until it's creamy, you pour it into a buttered tin pan an inch thick, and then when it's hard, you pour the chocolate over it. And then after two hours, you cut it into squares. And then you die. <laughs> <laughs> now... And then you make enemies of whoever you give this to. Now, 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 now hang, on, hang on a fucking second here. You pour this into a, a, into a tin pan and it turns hard? I guess because it's mostly sugar? <laughs> Why do you put chocolate on top of it? But then you put the... Oh, and you... Oh my god. It's safe to say these recipes were not run through an editor or anything. Let's just uh, this, put it that is, way. This, this is from Mrs. Ginocro. Fuck you, Mrs. Ginocro. You're a monster. <laughs> Get this away from me. I never want to eat potatoes ever again. Uh, and this podcast is over because I, I might vomit. All right. With that, we're all set here. Check, please. Fuck. Wow, that that was a long episode. I'm excited to see if the timestamp actually says it was long, because it felt long. I don't know if that's just because that fucking last five minutes made it seem like an eternity. But we're finally at the end. So that's it for this week's edition of Poor Couples Food Guide Deep Dish Podcast. Remember, we are in fact the only podcast left where you're more likely to learn about cereal than serial killers. As always, you can find us on PoorCouplesFoodGuide.com, or you can search us on Facebook, YouTube, we're also on Instagram now as well, at PoorCouplesFoodGuide. You can write to us at PoorCouplesFoodGuide at gmail.com and ask for any cooking advice that you may need. You can also send any comments, feedback, criticism, hate mail, love mail, chain letters, postcards, and whatever random ponderings you should pass your mind. Once again, that's PoorCouplesFoodGuide at gmail.com. If anyone out there dares to make that potato candy, please send us pictures and let us know how it is. If you're able to, like, make it to a computer or your smartphone or anything and you don't just, like, pass out as soon as you eat it. Also, if you decide to make that for whatever fucking reason, please don't sue us. I, I, and this, don't send it to us either. We don't want to eat it. This is Eric and Meg saying, do not make that recipe. You might die. Also, quick shout out to Patrick on Facebook for his correct guess on this week's topic. Considering he's the aforementioned friend of mine who introduced me to Patty Melts, I I guess I'm not super surprised, but go check out his videos on YouTube. That's Patty Melt Productions, and uh, he makes a lot of cool shit on there. Next week, we'll be serving up another American favorite, albeit this one's a bit more localized. It's, uh, it's more of a New York favorite, and by New York favorite, I mean I, I legit think upwards of like 90% of all weddings, graduation, communions, and all other formal events in New York State feature this dish. Honestly, it was a shock when we discovered that it's not a nationwide phenomenon, so actually I'm really curious to see how many people outside of the tri-state area have actually heard of it. Until then, everyone, stay hungry and keep feeding that brain. And tummy. My face hurts from laughing at the recipe. You picked a good one. <laughs>